All right, good morning, everybody. Again, from uh, Silicon Valley, we are here today with another Mindy Chat. Today, we're going to talk about food and beverage. We have the opportunity to talk to uh, Kelly Van Dyke, Director of External Innovation and Technology Scouting at PepsiCo. Hi, Kelly. Hi, how are you? Very good. Good to have you here. Yeah, you too. Um, and uh, obviously, today, this is part of uh, the conversation we've been having with companies that we've been that uh, have been awarded uh, from the corporate startup stars and so congratulations to pepsico to be part of that a successful group of uh, companies this is the badge that uh, you got for your activities on 2020 and that's what we want to talk about in the in the last next uh, half an hour yeah that's quite an honor i wish i could claim all the credit but either way it's still quite an honor for the group no, that's that's the beauty of being on a, on a, on an interview. You can you can credit whatever you want. So, so um, PepsiCo, a very large organization, we're talking about food and beverage. Uh, help us um, navigate really the galaxy of PepsiCo, uh, both internationally and then specifically in the area, then uh, where you sit. Yeah. Um, that it is. And often the, that's the biggest battle we have internally and externally is finding the right person. And you have to you have to know how to navigate the galaxy that is PepsiCo. So on a very macro level, we're divided amongst our foods and our beverage organization. We also have our regional um, sectors that travel around the world that cover off food and beverage within those particular regions. North America is one of the only ones where we split it between the two because the size of our beverage and food organization is quite large. So we do need to separate them out. Um, then within this particular organization that I sit in, I'm a part of R&D, we sit within the chief ROM, uh, within our chief commercial officers group. And we have an, our lead of our R&D, Renee Lammers. He leads our global R&D organization. And our R&D organization is also then set up between supporting the foods and beverage category, as well as the sector. So where we spoke about some of the regions are power of one where food and beverages together, the R&D groups also mirror that as well. Additionally, we have a, a handful of groups, what you might call support functions that are organized globally. And I sit within one of those, our life science organization, which is where our external innovation and technology scouting group resides. We're really um, focusing on the globe and support the globe and all of those R&D associates that sit around the world. That's a really quick snapshot, but <laughs> yes, and we'll we'll need to get back there because it's, yeah. uh, there are a lot of uh, micro complexities that I would like to readdress, in particular in the structure of uh, uh, R&D versus then the innovation part, which is one of the key yeah. elements of our conversation. Before going there, though, uh, just for uh, the folks that are uh, less familiar with PepsiCo, uh, just to give some numbers, maybe help us. Uh, of the hundreds of, uh, of brands that you guys manage. Uh, I mean, here we're looking at in 20, 2019, they had 60, $67 billion in the retin revenues, at 10 billion in operating profit, uh, $23 billion brands. Uh, give us some some names of, uh, of the brands that you guys manage. Of those billion dollar brands, I think it's up to 25 $1 billion brands now. Since 25, you've got it. there we go, um, so there's still old data. We're still growing. Uh, so those could be things like Doritos, Mountain Dew, Gatorade, Quaker, Tropicana, our Naked Smoothies in the US. Um, also in Brazil, we have Tudinho. In Russia, we have our Wimbledon brand. We have a lot of local brands as well that are still quite uh, large contributors to those net revenues that you're talking about, even though they're not part of that $1 billion brand list. Pretty much half of the stuff that we eat is coming is coming your way. Um, so let's talk about the importance of R and D first, right? In an entity like yourself, um, uh, can you? I mean, I know it's hard to draw a line, but how many people work if you were to draw a number into the R and D function? I always get this number wrong, um, to be honest with you, because it's always more than I think it is. So then I go really high. It is, it's, it's in the thousands. How about I put it that way? There's definitely thousands of R&D associates that sit around the world that support all of the foods. Every, every package that's sold every day, we're supporting um, every one of those in one way or another. And, and now going closer to our world of reference in the innovation department, um, 
what's a little bit of history of how the innovation function in particular when it comes to the external innovation which is basically your role mm -hmm. uh what was the evolution of, of of your role within the company and you know moving from as a typical friend friends that most of large companies have had really from a very internally focused r d into an activity that is much more dynamic with the inputs that are coming from from the innovators outside yeah sure so I would say it's been about six years now. The group that I'm in was officially created in not quite the, the iteration it is today, but it was brought together, the people around the company who were focusing on external innovation. Prior to that, they, they existed, um, but they weren't within a single function. They were embedded within the different organizations or different groups of R&D that felt that they needed that to really accelerate their growth. Um, Naked that I mentioned being one of those that really felt they needed to make sure they were staying ahead of the curve in the technology to keep their brand relevant with the consumers. About six years ago, um, they were brought together under the strategy organization and saying, hey, we really need to focus on this and make this a core competency of PepsiCo's. And that's when it was created mostly as it is today where we um, are globally based. So we sit around the world but we we are part of one organization in the end and we have the same focus we all have the same mission where we're going out and we're seeking the newest best technologies that support the pepsico r d agenda so if you look at r d and we have a vision of where we want to be five to ten years from now to support the company's greater vision some things we have more than enough capabilities to build internally some we know we really need help externally to leapfrog where we are or accelerate where we are and that's where we step in and we start looking around the world to find who's the best partner, who's out there who has this or who's the best partner to go make it and we can jointly create it together. And, and let me understand how that reports into a chief medical officer that then goes into uh, you know, commercial. I mean, that's kind of complicated, but especially the medical part of it, how, how is that important into your, you know, as part of your evaluation of innovation? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Antonio Tatarani, he is our chief medical officer, as you pointed out, as well as the senior vice president of our life science organization. So for us, that's talking about things like nutrition science and, and what's the best nutrition for consumers to be eating and drinking every day of their life to help them lead the best life that they want to. It also includes our Gatorade Sports Science Institute, where we do all of our physiological testing on athletes. Um, either our professional athletes or our everyday athletes, as we call them, to keep them performing at their best. As you can tell, that's very, very um, heavy on the science and the medical part of what's happening in the consumer's life. If and when you layer on the past years, um, years activities within COVID, he's been very active within our PepsiCo community as well as external and, and really making um, suggestions to how we operate internally through this really crazy pandemic, as well as talking with other multinational CPG companies. So that's where the medical piece also comes from. He is a medical doctor with a PhD who has come from really renowned um, pharma companies and NIH in the past. And then he reports into, as you said, the chief scientific officer who has not only the medical part, but the product development, the rest of the innovation that is necessary to get the products to the market. So uh, tell us a little bit more about your role. So as director of uh, external innovation technology scouting, what, what do you do on a daily basis? On a daily basis, I'd spend probably at least half of my talking time talking to people outside of PepsiCo. We're talking to those um, connections we've made through you know, great organizations such as yourselves and others where we're speaking to people and we're talking about what it is that we're searching for and um, people have great networks. So we spend that time talking a lot and talking to people about their technology, their science. I would say another quarter of the time, it's then having those internal conversations and saying, tell me what it is you really need. Um, what is it that you want the company to be five years from now, which is not an easy conversation when you have stock, um, stock and shareholders who are looking at the last quarter's activities. They're not looking for where you want to be five years at a time. So making sure we're pushing on those conversations and saying, where do we really think we should be looking around the corner and should be going after? And then I'd say the other 25% of the time is trying to take a moment to think, <laughs> honestly, think about what I've heard and think about what I've not heard. And how do those two pieces come together to, to then kind of guide, what do I need to go look for next? Who are those next startup companies I need to go search for? And speaking of the activities that you guys do with ex 
the world of startups, I mean, obviously there is also the scientific part that uh, I would live outside of our conversation more. I try to concentrate more on the activities that you do in the open innovation, in particular with it, with startups. Um, help us again, navigate uh, the different areas of the company they've been dealing, uh, whether through investments or through accelerators or to uh, integration with startups. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are three different functions that sit within this, this organization we're in, within the Chief Commercial Officers Organization. We have our venturing groups, and um, they are the ones people think of first and foremost, to be, to be honest with you, because they're out there looking for the company with the end goal to do minority investments into them. Um, companies that are really forefront and leaders in their category where PepsiCo is hoping to go in the future. So they'll take minority stakes in, in various stages of companies as well. It's really about the end algorithm and how does it work with PepsiCo's vision. And Kelly, just to, before we move from there, uh, I mean, the focus is still innovative companies or can they be, you know, potentially a new upcoming brand where the, the technology is not that important, but is actually might be of, of interest for, for PepsiCo as a group? It could be. I, I will say from the handful that I'm aware of, generally they need to have the brand with the technology. We're looking for both. Um, we do have strong marketers within our company and our organization. So if we, if we need to go create a brand, we hopefully have that ability to do it. It's how do you match the brand with a consumer pull and a consumer need? Um, an example of one of the most successful we've had coming in through the Venturings group is our Kavita line. So Kombucha's great brand, mm -hmm. but also new technology that we have, have within our portfolio. So, Got it. Okay, and then and then there is the accelerator. Yes, so um, the accelerator is is less a team per se, but more an activity that the venturing arm supports. We've completed it for the last five or four years, I should say. Started in Europe um, for the first two uh, iterations of it, and has now been in the U.S. for the last two. And actually, just today, great timing for you. We announced the finalists for the fifth version of our Greenhouse Accelerator this year. And this is a program that's focused on mentorship. We provide a $20,000 grant, no equity at all. It, it's free money to the companies. And during the next six months, we provide them also mentors with various functions from supply chain, marketing, consumer, R&D to help accelerate their business and how do they grow themselves which each each of those 10 companies then have the chance to win $100,000 at the end of the six months, depending on how much they've grown their company through that time and how they've really utilized their PepsiCo mentors. So it's a really great program, <clears throat> really building a lot of um, fantastic entrepreneurs in the ecosystem. And frankly, for us, it's a great opportunity to build that entrepreneurial spirit inside of a, of a massive CPG which doesn't always, as we know, move at the same speed as an entrepreneur and a startup. So how do you build that spirit as well? So a lot of reverse mentoring happening there too. So, and and how do you do that? So what, what's the end result or the end objective of uh, supporting this mentoring program with the pretty good and significant grants? What do you expect to happen year, years from now as a result of uh, that in interaction? Yeah, so I would say first and foremost, for us, it's really about the reverse mentorship and building that spirit internally. We know that the food industry is moving at a much greater pace than it ever has before. Consumers are expecting more and more out of it. And it means continuing to operate as a traditional multinational CPG isn't gonna, it isn't gonna necessarily get us where we wanna be. So we need to think about things differently. So that's a huge part of it for us is, is building that spirit. For the companies, we really hope that, that we've helped kick off and enable their growth. And, and it could be relationships that we've, they, we've helped them make outside of PepsiCo um, to help grow their business. Um, there is, of course, the opportunity for every one of these companies to enter into some sort of agreement one way or another with PepsiCo. Could it be a distribution agreement? Could it be an R&D development agreement? It's all the way up to an investment. That's a possibility for sure. And uh, give, give us some example of uh, some of the companies that have been through uh, that process also to understand, you know, which kind of companies are, are a good fit for you. Yeah. So last year's winner, I'll start with that one, was a company called Spudzy. They are a sweet potato extruded puff 
snack. So think something like our Cheeto product, but made with sweet potatoes instead of corn. Uh, it was a really exciting and new format. Uh, consumers, if you look on the snack aisle, they're looking for new formats. You see all of the beet chips and the sweet potato chips. So it was a really new way to use the sweet potato and still provide consumer enjoyment in that snacking occasion. They did a great job using their $20,000 grant and growing their business. Um, so that was last year's winner. The year before that was a company called Happy Water, which is focused on kids. It's a no calorie, uh, no sugar, a uh, water-based beverage with vitamins and nutrients in it that consumer or kids need, but really tastes great. Um, they also did a fantastic job and increased their distribution dramatically during the time of the program. So those are two recent examples of companies. Um, and then the second part of your question, oh, I forgot now <laughs> what it was talking about. Those no, but just just to understand what who I mean, what are the areas that can be a good fit? And, mm -hmm. and I guess the, the part of that question is who decides what are the uh, you know, any given time, right, any new batch, uh, what are the focus areas that would make sense to push for? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So I would say it's really dependent on, on the priorities for the next three years at that point in time, um, as well as who has the capacity to really step in and lead. It's, it's not um, a zero time based commitment from a PepsiCo side. You know, you heard that we offer six months of mentorship from up to 20 different mentors across the organization with weekly one hour meetings. And it's a lot of time. So we really have to make sure we know who has the most time to commit to that. Um, but I will say that the, the focus does shift to your point every year. And it's really based on the consumer trends. Um, taking a look at this year's program, for instance, we've shifted the focus from those consumer brands that I was just talking about to actually be more about emerging science and technology that is really built on growing consumers' wellness. Their health, you know, with, with COVID happening these days, it's really accelerated a trend that was already there, which is consumers looking to take greater control of their health and wellness and being more proactive in it. So we've we've taken a look at that. We see that things are accelerating in a trend that was already there, and we felt now was a really great time to move our shift or shift our focus, I should say, from the consumer facing brands to really being about the technology and the science to build those brands. Is this program global by nature? So can you can you host companies that are coming from Latin America or Asia? So I guess silver lining to our current pandemic situation is it's enabled us to have a virtual 100% um, virtual program to reach everywhere in the world. So we do, in fact, um, of the 10 finalists that we have, they are from around the world, stretching from India, Europe, the, and all parts of the U.S. Um, as well. So we've really tried our best to reach every part of the world and get representation. You get 10 companies every every year, every six months. And what is the, how many applications do you normally receive on average? Oh, it can be 200, 400, 500, really depends. But this particular year, we went through over 200 to come down to the final 10. Got it. Uh, you talked about reverse mentoring. How does that work? You know, how do you associate uh, the folks from within the company? And is that mostly people working the, in the R&D structure? Or is that um, across, across the, across the board? Across the company, for sure. So uh, I'll speak for a moment um, to the companies and then how we translate that into the reverse mentoring. So when the companies come in and apply, we ask them, what do you think PepsiCo can best help you build? And we're really looking for their needs. And based on their needs, we then go into the organization and match up the right people for them. So their needs could be something from manufacturing. It could be distribution. It could be how do, what, how do I refine the sales story to the consumer? Any part of that, um, that value chain of the product. And we go find those people. So it is truly mentors across the organization. This year, we have folks from our design team in New York City. We have our R&D associates in India, we have our supply chain um, in Dallas, Texas. We've really covered the gamut to get these companies what they need. So then speaking back to your question on reverse mentoring, we have found through the last four years that by just engaging these mentors with these entrepreneurs, it sparks so much excitement for those mentors. And we find they take that back into the company, into their group, into their peers. And it's, it's, just grows immensely that sort of excitement on thinking about how you do things differently and just because this is how we've always doesn't done it doesn't mean this is how we have to do it today so we see a lot of that growing so that's one avenue of it 
Additionally, we love to have these companies come back and then speak to broader or parts of our organization. So we've done that quite a bit where we've had some of the finalists come back and speak to parts of our organization to talk to them about how they've balanced risks and trade-off and benefit analysis and, and how can we integrate that more into what we're doing. One of the main tension that we normally see also in large companies like yours, where R&D is really at the core uh, of the value of the company, is the you know, not built here syndrome, right? It's to try to find the right balance of uh, getting input from the outsiders versus things that can be done inside. How, how do you see that at, at PepsiCo? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, coming back to my role for a moment where my job is to go out and find great technology outside of the company and convince R&D people who are brilliant scientists that they should take this and incorporate it into their work. Um, I think that it is it is a mentality, it's a culture, and you in and it's it is through things like the accelerator that you start to change that mentality and you see that, hey, it's not that I can't do this, it's just that how can I work with them to make our two pieces of work even better? So how do you make that shift? It's certainly something that um, is is really growing immensely and very quickly within the R&D organization at PepsiCo. I'm very happy to say that. I think other endeavors that we have, such as the Hive, which, which we can come to in a minute if you'd like, where the focus is not perfection, but progress, has really also helped to build that mentality of, I don't have to get it perfect, I really just need to make progress, see what consumers think, take their input, and continue to iterate and refine. Uh, let's talk about the hive then let's talk about more of a, how do you measure then eventually the outcome or potential success so the hive yes so the hive is actually a business unit so it's not a function or a group per se but it is a business unit that currently sits within our foods organization and again reports into our chief commercial officer the goal of that is to operate in our e-com world and it's really grow our presence in the e-com world number one Number two, it's using that avenue and venue as a way for us to, to test with consumers, build new brands, build new, um, new technologies, and go out quickly, very quickly being the key word here, and understand if what consumers are saying they want is what they truly want. So when we give them the product, are they buying it? Are they coming back to it time and time again? Um, we have a new product that we've launched in the keto world, for instance, that's sold on Amazon today. And it's something consumers have said they've wanted. So we've been able to really push push the boundaries and say, is it really what you do want? And we're finding that it is. Um, the end goal is to get the growth, of course, on e-com, but with, um, with a pathway to get us into brick and mortar and then fitting into the rest of, in this case, the, the Pepsi, or the, I'm um, sorry, the foods portfolio so that it would sit on our warehouse and be made in our plants just like everything else. Uh, is there any um, interaction between the hive and the the, the greenhouse accelerator? Um, and the accelerator, yes. In fact, some of the key folks within that organization are acting as mentors. They already have that spirit about them, so they're really great mentors. We find, and the more they can learn from the entrepreneurs and bring it back into the way we operate within the hive, the better. Got it. Um, and so tell us the kind of measurement of success of, uh, of those programs in general. Some might be common, some might be, you know, uh, very specific in the, in the activities, like leaving venture group outside because clearly, I mean, we understand that that will be a financial and strategic outcome, but more on the, on the hive and accelerator. How do you measure then eventually success? Yeah. So for the Hive, for instance, um, they are setting success for them. I, I think it is a two or three year window. I'm not sure the exact numbers these days. Um, you know, how many years can we run it in e-com before we think we have a foothold to get into brick and mortar? That is really their end goal and their end output. To then put it, um, if you will, or, or kind of dock it into the greater PepsiCo foods system or the greater PepsiCo beverage system so that it can really then grow through our massive distribution channels um, and our distribution means that that's really what we excel at. So let's talk about this this last part because um, you have a pretty wide range I assume then uh, of, of potential partners in the in the world of startups you're, you're looking at. Is that driven by some of the you know, input that you get from your business units or how do you decide what organization makes sense to look for when you do your external scouting? 
Yeah, great question. So for us, we do at least once a year check in with our key partners and our key customers or key partners in this case is actually the R&D organization. Our goal is to create joint development agreements or statement of work activities that sit within and reside within the R&D organization. So knowing that's our end goal, because that will then lead to commercial launches of product on the shelf later. That's our key customer. We check with them at least once a year, as I said, to say, what are your priorities for the next five years? What do you need to deliver? And um, how can we help you? What do you not have the capabilities to do in-house? As we mentioned, we have fantastically smart scientists who can build just about anything if given the right time. Um, but which of these great technologies do you need to accelerate? Which do you need to move faster and leapfrog where we sit today that we can go find somebody outside who's already doing that and then we can collaboratively take that technology and build it into an, um, a PepsiCo R&D program. That is really our success and that's how um, we're linking in. So the, the priorities are driven from our R&D organization. Of course, our R&D organization priorities are driven by the business priorities and where does the business wanna go in the end? So that's the end linkage to our business, but the immediate conversations are with our R&D partners. Uh, but again, I mean, in practicality, you're talking to an organization of uh, you know tens of thousands of people. How do you structure that conversation in a way that is effective? Yeah, great question. Um, the key is what we call our want briefs. So tell me very specifically, what do you want to happen? That's the conversation that we have often with our customers. You know, it's easy to say, hey, um, can you find me all of the plant proteins that are out there? Well, yes, I can, and I can find you 200 of them. But what do you want them to do for you? Do you want hmm. them to deliver a protein content? Do you want them to be the end substrate that we're going to put seasoning on? Do you want them to provide mouthfeel? What do you want them to be? Because that's going to truly dictate what I'm going to go find. In addition, you know, what are the constraints the business has? Is it that it can't be animal-based? It can't be, um, it can't, has to be highly sustainable, okay, then maybe we're headed to algae versus I'm going to soy. You know, it's going to be all of these type of constraints and conversations really dictate what I need to go search for. And having those conversations up front really help us and set us up for success to bring the right things to the customer in the end to deliver success to the final commercial product. Uh, who are your uh, typical counterparts within the organization as our uh, product managers, brand managers, or more people at the core of R&D processes? Yeah, um, I would say we have two key customers that we often work with. One is our, our strategy team and our strategy group, either our global strategy across R&D, or actually really most often embedded within a category. So food strategy, if you will, or a beverage strategy. They are again, the ones talking to the business to know really where they're headed. So they can help direct us and say, Hey, these are the big macro challenges we need to solve. Then, which is when we bring in our, to your point, the, the hardcore scientists, it's what we call our science and technology teams. They're the ones working on the technologies that get embedded into the products. We can take that list from our, our functional, our category strategy and say, which of these do we think we know how to do ourselves and we're ready to run with them? Which, um, well, we think we can figure it out, but we could probably run faster with a partner. We make that choice in, in conjunction with our science and technology teams to make sure we're not doing redundant work. Nobody wants to do that. Um, and we're really helping the R&D agenda in the end. I was about to go there. Yeah, so uh, again, sustainable development and sustainability goals, SDGs, I'm sure they are today one of your main driver of uh, not only R&D, but also the way that you communicate and, and you express your positioning. Um, how is that? today dictating uh, you know the new innovations both at the, you know your level when you're uh, pick and choose or at the accelerator level yeah so um, I'll start with some of our commitments for a moment and then that can kind of trickle down to the impact that they have we have a, a several main commitments that we bucket into our our people's sustainability or our human sustainability our um, our ecosystem sustainability, like the world itself, um, those are those are really what we're focusing on. And when it comes to you know the world and that sustainability, that's about how do we reduce our greenhouse gases? How do we use less plastic? How do we use less water? How do we use less um, fertilizers when we go all the way back to the farms where we're buying our potatoes and our oats, for instance? 
So those absolutely impact the choices we're making. You're hundred percent right on what we're looking for. You know, we're looking for ways to really have better linkage between the water that we apply to our crops to make sure that it's not runoff and that it is useful water and that we water when it's needed, not when it's raining outside or when when we're protecting it, we're, we're watering the right amount for the stage of the seed, for instance. And then from the people side and the people's sustainability, how do we not only make sure the people themselves are living great lives and we're positively impacting the communities where we produce in, so where our plants are, for instance, um, that we're not taking all of the water from that particular region, as, as an example, um, down to the farms that we're farming on. How are we making a positive impact on those farmers' lives and the women in those communities and those women farmers? Um, and then taking it and turning that on its head a little bit, it also looks at our portfolio itself and saying, how do we improve the products that we're selling? Reduce the sugar, reduce the salt, reduce the saturated fat so that what consumers are buying from us are healthier than what they were a couple of years ago. And, and this is, I think, at, at a corporate level, specifically in, in your function in, uh, in innovation, what, what do you think will be some of the two or three examples of uh, innovations that you're particularly excited about and you'll also focus your um, your scouting in the in the next uh, couple of years. Yeah, I would say there's two that are embedded within that that I think are really exciting, really great changes and and innovations coming out. And one is in the sustainability, the packaging sustainability. We're seeing really fantastic technologies coming out. So how do we enable from how do we enable the recyclability of PET moving from mechanical um, recycling, which means physically destroying the bottle itself and remaking it into something else to chemical and so me, Sorry to interrupt. Uh, and that would be done by the consumer or, or by? No, no, today the consumer oh. drops it off either at their curbside or in a recycling bin and they take it off. And the way it is recycled today a lot of times is physically destroying it, melting it and turning it into something right. else. Um, there's a lot of great technology that's actually not taking that approach, but rather chemically or enzymatically breaking it down to the actual chemicals that make the plastic bottles to begin with. And then you remake it again into something else. It's much more um, efficient and enables a lot of, a large, larger degree of recyclability of those. So I think what's going to come next on the sustainability for packaging is really exciting to see what's coming. Good. Uh, Kelly, what's the most difficult part of your job? Oh, goodness. Um, the most difficult part of my job is finding enough time really to talk to all the great technologies that are out there. There's just not enough hours in the day. Um, so I've tried to compensate that by parts of my team are in Asia. So between the two of us, we're hopefully working 24 hours a day and we can punt the meetings back and forth between us. But there's really just not enough time to meet with all the great companies that are out there. Excellent. Uh, you Just to finish, just, you know, a, a look into the future. It looks like, a, again, this uh, pandemic has changed a number of processes. And uh, on a positive side, it sounded like, at least in the activities that you're doing with Accelerator and, and uh, integration with your company that also has enabled much more flexibility into, you know, talking to people and, and making sure that uh, uh, really this access is, uh, is, is global. Um, do you think that is there to stay? Do you think that uh, most, some of your processes will be, um, you know, changed and digitalized for good after this experience? I think, I think there will be definitely some changes going forward. I don't think we can say that everything will stick. There are certainly parts, you know, coming back to the accelerator as an example, Typically right now I would be in New York and we would be having live person to person kickoffs with these companies and you know, having all the networking events over snacks in the back of the room. Um, and we're just not able to do that. So we're doing the best we can to create that environment and to create that feeling with virtual um, experiences. So I think when it comes to the end of it, you know, as this is an example, we'll have to pro re, um, compare the pros and the cons to being able to get that global reach in this instance versus what do we lose by not being able to come together um face to face yeah and we'll see we'll see how that uh, evolves so for now congratulations again uh Thanks. for all the good stuff that uh, you guys have been uh, uh, delivering and uh 
and we'll talk very soon. Thanks again. Stay safe. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.